So in this one, we're going to be talking about Kenjaku, the guy who took over Geto's body. So who exactly is this body snatching guy whose face changes quicker than her revolving door? Besides being very old and a worse father than Toji was to Megumi, there's a lot to uncover about Kenjaku's story. So Kenjaku's worst deeds start around the Meiji era, which is like 1868 to 1912. But he's actually over 1000 years old, which is why he's so well acquainted with the immortal Dengue. Around 400 years ago, Kenjaku was in an unknown man's body, which is what he used to make binding vows with ancient sorcerers. That's also when Kenjaku convinced an aging Kajimi Kashimo to become a cursed object so he could return later and fight Sukuna to prove which of them is the new strongest. But that's not all Kenjaku was up to. For centuries, the six eyes and star plasma vessels have gotten in the way of Kenjaku's goals and extensive plans. Even when he took them out, a new vessel would be born and a user of the six eyes would appear at the right time. This is why Kenjaku focuses on other ways to get them out of the picture. Toji's help also played a major and unexpected role in his success, since he both killed a vessel on the day of the merger and created a rift between Gojo and the owner of the six eyes and curse manipulation user Geto. But let's jump back a bit. Around 150 years ago, before the start of the series, Noritoshi Kamo's body was taken over by Kenjaku and the man already had a temple to use. So it was a no-brainer for him to use that place for nefarious experiments with blood manipulation techniques. There, the sorcerer imprisoned a woman who could bear children with curses and created hybrid babies with her, while adding in his own blood as well. Originally, she had gone there for protection, but uh, that didn't turn out so great. Kenjaku made her have nine abortions, creating the death painting wounds. The two brothers we saw confront Yuji and Nobara, Esso and Kechizu, are technically related to him, and we'll get to how later. But the other seven children were named Naranzo, Shouoso, Tanzo, Sanso, Kotsuso, Shoso, and Choso, who plays an important role down the line. This not only made Kamo's namesake gain the title of the most evil sorcerer in history because of that, but likely tarnished the clan's reputation. After all, that Kenjaku only really wanted to find out what would be created and how interesting and strong the entities would become. Not to mention there must be a lot of ego involved, since he made himself the third parent to these children. But how does Kenjaku keep jumping around these bodies like this? Well, the hint is in the stitches. He basically performs brain surgery, taking over bodies to use as his new form, and using his brain as the control center. Kenjaku also gains their curse technique, or whatever the previous body had available. And the transition is seamless. Even Gojo's highly coveted six eyes couldn't see through this nasty technique. But anyway, after after disappearing for a while, Kenjaku finds more subjects to experiment on. This time it involves Yuji's mother, Kaori, whose body he takes over despite Yuji's grandfather, Wasuke, warning Yuji's father, Jin, of the danger of that woman. Yuji's eventually left alone. It's not clear what Kenjaku did with their bodies, but we can assume they both died. Kenjaku's involvement in Yuji's creation also explains why he, even prior to learning about cursed energy, was so physically gifted and athletic. And because he helped birth Yuji, whether literally or just with his blood, this makes Yuji a sibling to the cursed wombs he unknowingly fought and killed. Perhaps that explains why Yuji felt bad when he saw them crying. As if that wasn't enough already, Kenjaku had the finger planted in Junpei's home in order to trigger his curse technique through negative emotions. He might not have meant for the young man to be killed by Mahito, but he didn't care either. Anything to further his plans and to test things out. Around this time is likely when Kenjaku also laid the foundations for spreading cursed energy to non-jujitsu users in hopes of creating more of them. A lot of them weren't compatible with this process though, like Megumi's sister Sumiki, who fell into a coma. Of course, there was a solution to that which requires some time to be resolved. And Kenjaku is nothing if not patient. But was Megumi's sister chosen simply because of bad luck? Or because of the importance Megumi would play in Sukuna's return due to his 10 shadows technique? It's hard to say, but Kenjaku probably thought he might need Megumi's shadows against Gojo to take down the Limitless and Six Eyes combination. But going further, in 2018, Suguru Geto returns from the dead? 
Not really. With a useful technique like her spirit manipulation, there was no way Kenjaku could pass up on the chance to acquire this corpse, since Gojo was too attached to his deceased best friend to destroy his body completely. With his body, Kenjaku made temporary allies of the special grade curses, Mahito, Jogo, Hanami, and Dagon. But they're all just a means to a bigger research project he's been working on. And seeing as they had Gojo as a common threat, they agreed to work with Kenjaku to get the Six Eyes user out of the Way. Before they could proceed, they needed to acquire the prison realm and see just how powerful Sukuna was now. Kenjaku suggested sealing Gojo as the only way to defeat him, while carefully keeping himself out of sight from any jujitsu sorcerer who could recognize his body. He also didn't fight anyone to avoid leaving residuals behind, which Gojo would have immediately picked up on. With the finger planted at Junpei's house returned to Jujutsu High, Kenjaku now knows where to find the ones they have stored there. Yes, he put a track on it, but he can't go himself. Again, because, you know, people would see him. At the same time, three of the wombs he created are stolen by Mahito. Days later, the curse hybrids are given bodies and sent on an errand to get more Sukuna fingers and keep him on Kenjaku's side. Choso is left behind, but surprisingly doesn't even sense his creator's presence in Geto's body. Then comes October 31st. For the prison realm to work, it takes 20 minutes of preparation and a full minute to seal the victim. So after everything was set up in Shibuya, thanks to those working with him, Kenjaku used the body he was in to more or less neutralize Gojo, but not before making sure to drain Gojo's mind thoroughly, similarly to the way Toji did in the past. As we've seen, Gojo was extremely attached to Geto, so seeing his friend back from the dead ensured Gojo would be too stunned to escape and got locked inside the prison realm. Despite being an evil mastermind, not everything Kenjaku wanted during this battle came to pass. He missed out on absorbing Jogo because Sakuta killed him, but he did get his hands on Mahito, so he can now activate his trap card. I mean, the cursed energy that he had spread out years ago, and allowing those incompatible bodies to be transfigured and capable of wielding cursed techniques, or be turned into proper vessels like Yuji. Even a combination of jujitsu students and Toto's teacher Yuki aren't enough to take Kenjaku down before he unleashes transfiguration on the marked people. Luckily for us, using idle transfiguration was a one-time deal, since Kenjaku absorbed Mahito and expended him with an Uzumaki attack. But to be fair, Mahito was planning to attack Kenjaku anyway. Afterwards, Kenjaku left with another ancient sorcerer named Urarame, preparing his next big moves. And that brings us to the Culling Game. The Culling Game is one of the final steps towards Kenjaku's ultimate goal of making the entire population of Japan merge with Tengen. He started the game, but he's not the game master, meaning he can't change how it's played. Well, at least for the most part. But the technique he used not only brought back old threats, but created new curse technique users from regular people to join the game. Non-combatants were allowed to leave the colonies because their lives wouldn't be spared in the end regardless. Keep in mind, all these normal people would be fodder for the massive curse spirit Kenjaku wants to create. But anyway, remember that guy Kashima? Well, he's brought back as promised. There's also Angel, who is inside of Hanakurusu, much like Sukuna and Yuji. And there's also Yorozu, who reincarnates inside of Sumiki's body. And then there's those who are unfortunate enough to face off with Yuta Kotsu and a few others. Kenjaku takes over the Kamo clan, forcing our young Noritoshi out. Considering the blood manipulation technique he has, the cursed wombs are like ancestors to him and vastly more potent since they don't have to worry about bleeding to death like a human would. So with Gojo sealed and the Zenin clan destroyed by Maki, there aren't many people who can oppose Kenjaku and his role in the Jujutsu world. But Kenjaku inadvertently created a potentially more powerful version of Toji Zenin with his culling game colonies. After all the panic and death from Shibuya, Kenjaku goes to the USA and lets them know of an untapped power source in Japan, Cursed Energy, but not warning them of the dangers of curses. Evidently, it's to try to create more means of Cursed Energy, aka negative energy, and death through having them join in the games and being killed or taking down sorcerers. The country agrees and sends 800 militants over to kidnap as many jujitsu users as possible, since Gojo is already sealed and not a threat. But Kenjaku doesn't create chaos just for the sake of it. He wants to know what will happen if Tengen and all of Japan create a massive cursed spirit and what it would look like. Likewise, Tengen knows the ancient sorcerer and the way he thinks as well, and even prepares a means to free Gojo before they're confronted by Kenjaku. Another slight wrench in Kenjaku's big lifetime goal 
Cole. And because Tengen didn't merge with Riko Amane 12 years ago and evolved, they became closer to a curse. This makes Kenjaku's curse manipulation perfect to control the ancient immortal. There's a small issue to deal with first though. Yuki and Choso are there to protect anything from happening to Tengen. They do their best to stop Kenjaku, but are no match for his experience and the amount of curse techniques he's acquired over time. He devastates Yuki with a tiny Uzumaki attack aimed at a lethal area, and she resorts to using a black hole against him, ultimately failing, and Choso is sent away to reunite with Yuji and the rest who oppose Kenjaku. The evil sorcerer finds Tengen's true body and continues forward. However, Kenjaku can't begin the merger until the culling game is over, since he took a binding vow beforehand. So that's another issue he has to deal with. He tries to overcome it by adding more rules, eventually glitching the Game Master out to force his success. But that's when Gojo is finally released. Kenjaku is notified at the exact moment and reveals the insane location he had left the prison room in hopes of slowing him down or killing Gojo. But instead, he's confronted by the man himself with a warning. Gojo's planning to get rid of Sukuna and Kenjaku on December 24th, the day that Geto was killed in the past. Until the fight begins, Kenjaku's stuck by Sukuna's side because he'll be instantly killed by Gojo indicating he knows he's weaker than him. But at the same time, he knows that if Gojo loses, the rest of the Jujutsu users will go after Sukuna, so he's free to do as he pleases, which is a lot of killing of the culling game players in the way of his merger. Seems like his patience is starting to run thin. Part of why the culling game is so important to Kenjaku is that he needs as much cursed energy built up as possible. So it's only normal that when he asks the Kogane how many players died from refusing to fight, he's disappointed in how large the number is. In case you're wondering, 61 people died by force curse technique removal. Likewise, Kenjaku doesn't like Tengen for never trying to engage physically or facing down a threat to reach a greater goal. But he has other things to worry about, like how much time he has before the Jujutsu Sorcerers come after him after dealing with Sukuna. But at least Gojo and Kashimo don't seem to be threats anymore. With that in mind, Kenjaku goes off to get rid of the players not doing what he wants them to do. The first one happens to be an incarnated woman trying her best to escape Kenjaku as he hunts her down. He catches her, of course, choking her with a curse he covers her head with. No remorse for what he's doing to someone he brought back to life. She's played her part, after all. Now he just needs to get to his end goal of amassing enough cursed energy to combine with Tengen and all of Japan. Another player, Hazunoki, shows up wondering how Kenjaku finds them so easily. As it turns out, the incarnated sorcerers are tagged with the cursed objects he used to bring them back. While awakened sorcerers have a seal on them that he can track, either way, Kenjaku can find them anytime he wants to, but before that, he checks in on Mei Mei's livestream, glad to see that Gojo has lost. And even if someone other than Hazunoki wanted to come fight Kenjaku, he has arrangements in place already. For one, he's the second best barrier user besides Tengen, and he's hidden cursed spirits with barriers around him and Shinjuku. They're probably not very strong, but their job is to monitor any changes in cursed energy and their movements. So if someone such as Akotsu Yuta would be headed towards Kenjaku, he would know immediately. He also made sure to see what the curses see. So he can't be taken by surprise by a player without cursed energy, like Maki. But Kenjaku isn't saying all of that to prove how prepared he is. Rather, it's a way to make Hazunoki feel even more alone than he did before. Seeing as he refused to be Kenjaku's friend earlier, the fight begins with no warning, Kenjaku having sent out curses against Hazunoki in a flash. If you recall, the incarnated sorcerer can remove parts of his body and use them as explosives and reverse curse technique is in his arsenal as well. But is that enough to escape this onslaught of attacks from Kenjaku? Sadly, no. He's already stabbed Hazunoki in the neck and head, making sure that he can heal that part of his body. He's done with these sorcerers now, and wants to move on to the next step, ending the culling game so the binding vow can be fulfilled. And to do that, all the players have to die as soon as possible. But there's one man, not an incarnated sorcerer, standing in Kenjaku's way next. Takaba the Comedian, and considering all of his preparations, Kenjaku is visibly stunned by this man's appearance out of nowhere. There was no hint 
that he was nearby, and no notice from his curse is placed around. He's a mystery for Kenjaku, but because he's been given a curse technique and isn't an incarnated sorcerer, Kenjaku's not worried or even interested in Takaba. There is one exception to this, and that's Higuruma and his judge man Shikigami. Regardless, because Kenjaku has no expectations for Takaba, he's entering this confrontation with a different mindset than usual. If it were a Kotsu or Gojo coming his way, he'd be geared up to fight with everything he's got. What am I trying to say? Well, he's letting his guard down a bit. Maybe the way that Takaba confidently said that he arrived in the wrong place doesn't help. That aside, Kenjaku attacks the comedian anyway, expecting the large curse to end the fight with one attack. Instead, this just makes Takaba annoyed at Kenjaku's behavior and throws the pseudo-immortal into utter confusion. How could someone he thought had no potential survive that easily? The problem is that Kenjaku knows his attack was effective, but for some reason it didn't work the way it was supposed to. And because Takaba has provided Kenjaku with one of the two things he always longs for, entertainment, he actually smiles. A genuine smile, not the creepy one he had when Gojo figured out that he wasn't actually Ghetto. Although Kenjaku gets more serious, sending more curses after Takaba, his next attack has no effect either. All Takaba needs to do is make it funny for himself, and the damage is nullified. Not to mention that when Kenjaku goes for Takaba again, he ends up conjuring items from thin air. That includes a bandana for Kenny and cards for himself. This fact, more than anything else, has Kenjaku worried, because Takaba can control whatever items he summons from his imagination. Kenjaku knows that he wouldn't be able to stop the effect, even with the millennia of years he's been alive. But this is Kenjaku we're talking about. He's not going to give up so easily, especially since all curse techniques we've seen have some kind of weakness. It's just a matter of time until he finds a way to take Takaba down. Interestingly, while Kenjaku's conversing with Takaba and trying to get a read on him, the comedian brings up the possibility of giving up the whole merging idea if something more entertaining crossed his path. And Kenjaku isn't opposed to the thought. So while Kenjaku's planning to kill Takaba and move on, the comedian's trying to find a way to end this interaction more peacefully. But seeing as Takaba's goal is laughter, Kenjaku has already figured out his comedic style and the lack of humor it would bring to an audience. In a way, Kenjaku's thorough analysis and review of Takaba's joke makes the comedian start to doubt himself and think negatively. It allows Kenjaku to physically attack Takaba after having broken his confidence and he's pleased at the blow that he lands on the comedian. And sure, Takaba rejects Kenjaku's opinion since he's not a professional in his industry. But when Takaba suggests that they have a staring contest, the ancient sorcerer just goes along with it and even wins with surprisingly fun expression. It's another harsh blow to Takaba's ego, allowing Kenjaku to strike his body again. But when Kenjaku insists that Takaba should laugh, while he sees Hazunoki's dead body lying on the ground, the situation shifts. For Kenjaku, this moment of weakness seems like his chance to finish off Takaba, but instead the comedian startles him with an impressive bow as he apologizes. Of course, that's not his actual thoughts, but Takaba controlling the way that he thinks and the situation again. Another chance comes up for Kenjaku though. Takaba insists that he wants to make Kenjaku laugh no matter what, and if he can't, then that would make him lose his confidence again, and Kenjaku would gain the upper hand, right? That's when the special grade rebel spirit, Okuro Ootake, enters the challenge. But it's no match for Truck-kun, or should I say, Takaba driving a truck and pretending to be a drunk driver. This leads into a number of ridiculous sketches, like Takaba trying to bring a giant goldfish back to life, and Kenjaku goofily shocking him with defibrillators as well as the most musical game of rock, paper, scissors you'd expect to see in Jujutsu Kaisen. But the more this absurdity continues, the more Kenjaku understands what Takaba's curse technique is and how it works. He even figures out that it involves soul resonance, which explains why Kenjaku can't help but play along with whatever Takaba imagines. But instead of fighting Takaba or taking him down, he ends up joining in, possibly of his own choice eventually. You can only fight against someone's carefree fun for so long. Even when he tries to drown Takaba in the water, it turns into Fanta 
and Kenjaku looks so young and filled with joy. Deep down, he feels that he's going to lose if this continues. So instead of allowing Takaba to continue this farce and forcing him into continuous jokes, Kenjaku brings them into something more serious, a live performance on stage. As much as Genjaku wants it to demolish Takaba's mind and break out of the control he's holding, that's not what makes things start to fall apart. It's the fact that Takaba's enjoying this performance so much, but it's coming to an end. Coming out of that imaginary performance, Takaba's lying down in white clothing, dressed like someone who's passed on. Kenjaku has to admit that he has laughed because of the comedian, and seconds later, Yuta's behind him. It's too late for Kenjaku to react the way that he had planned, with all his barriers and curses and failsafes. He tries to use anti-gravity against Yuta, but it's too late. Takaba's distraction has succeeded long enough to get the ancient sorcerer's head cut off with one clean slice. As much as it seems like this is the end of Kenjaku, him saying that his will shall be carried on kind of leaves us with a bad taste in our mouth. Will Kenjaku just switch bodies again? Is this not the real him, but just a part of his curse technique? There's so much that can happen since Kenjaku's got a collection of curse techniques. He probably has some we've never seen him use. But for now, well, it seems like the culling game is over. And if Kenjaku comes back, we might not recognize him right away. But that's pretty much it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.